There are big differences, obviously, between drug production uh, and a fertility or an autologous cell lab. Obviously, in drug production, you're making lots of drugs, and those drugs could be embryonic stem cells in a vial. If there's a problem with a lot of drugs, that's a public health risk. Uh, there are literally thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people that can get sick from one bad drug lot. Obviously, autologous cell labs deal more with one-on-one -on -one patient risks. So those risks are very similar to what a hospital would experience or uh, an ambulatory surgery center or a physician uh, providing treatment. So if you look at public health risk here, you've got uh, drug production up there, so that on the bottom we have the number of people that might be adversely affected. You've got the public health risk off on the left. Uh, you've got mass production of stem cells in a vial, obviously a high public health risk, uh, a large number of people that could be adversely affected by a bad lot. You've got on either side there uh, MRSA, uh, do you guys have a, a laser pointer up here? I don't know if you... Oh, John's got one. Thanks, John. <laughs> that wasn't planned. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, you've got these two over here, uh, MRSA, uh, non-virulent seasonal virus outbreaks. Again, uh, these are things more uh, appropriate for disease surveillance. And then you've got what happens down here. You've got a low number of people, one-on-one -on -one patient risks. The public health risk is small. And that's basically what doctors do and doctors deal with on a day-to-day -day basis as they provide treatments. If we look at who regulates all of this, obviously you've got FDA in situations where you have high public health risk with a large number of people being impacted. You've got CDC monitoring diseases on either side. And you've got state medical boards monitoring what happens on one-on-one -on -one patient risks. Same thing here, if we just put some uh, information to it, oversight of one-on-one -on -one patient risks, disease surveillance, uh, oversight of mass production of foods, drugs, devices sold in interstate commerce. If we look at infection control in a stem cell culture lab, uh, we've got in our guidelines, and we have uh, these types of things in our lab, we actually have a, a stem cell culture lab in Colorado. Uh, positive pressure corridor, uh, biologic splashback hoods, good tissue handling practices, uh, disposables. There's cross-contamination protection. You clean hoods in between patient samples, one patient sample at a time in the workspace, use of disposables quarantine of samples containing known pathogens. So these are all just common sense things that have to happen in a stem cell lab that are part of our guidelines. If we look at culturing stem cells, uh, the first question is why would you want to culture stem cells? There, there literally are, I think, many treatments where culture is probably not necessary. Uh, we've already seen uh, good things and some good results from just using bone marrow aspirate concentrate, uh, that'll be talked about here today. Uh, but one of the things that Henry brought up is basically a minimal culture. We also use culture of mesenchymal stem cells. There are pro probably other applications where it's necessary to get a therapeutic effect. So you want to try to increase stem cell numbers, that's what a, a culture is about. Or you can precondition or select cells, which is what Henry was talking about. Uh, most animal research of models to date, so if we look back at the animal research and try to apply it to humans, have used uh, culture. Uh, there's very, very few animal models out there that haven't used culture. Uh, the rationale is pretty simple, and that is that, in general, uh, the reason why it's a thousand to one, a thousand studies using culture for one that hasn't, is primarily because in most instances, culture tends to be more effective. Uh, the critical dose of cells for many applications is likely below what can be obtained without culture expansion, although Henry talked about some unique ways to, uh, to isolate cells. And again, as I've said, for some, some applications, we may not e even need to, to go this route. If you look at stem cell culture, uh, the biologic potency of cells tends to decline with time. Uh, adverse changes of the cells tends to increase with time. So this is a very important thing to, to note. Uh, the longer you keep cells in culture, 
the more likely you are to have problems. So you have a window of trying to get more cells and having those cells still maintain their biologic potency without creating any adverse changes to the cells. Uh, other issues, uh, growth medium is important. Uh, we actually use autologous serum. Uh, fetal calf serum, though, however, is used more commonly uh, in the research. Uh, if you use fetal calf serum, there are obviously risks there, uh, and you've got to make sure that those risks are controlled. Uh, manipulation of cells, uh, you can do things to cells. You can centrifuge them. Uh, if you have reagents that are used, uh, our guidelines talk about using human reagents where possible and only exposing the cells to known physiologic exposures, i.e. replicating what's in the body and what happens in the body. So we've talked about the lab guidelines in here. There's obviously also practice guidelines and a treatment registry. Again, limiting type of cells, limiting changes to the cells, 